The Dairy Today Report is brought to you by CattleExchange.com, connecting cattle buyers and sellers nationwide. Indiana is one of the hardest hit states as far as the Midwest drought. Statewide, the corn crop saw another five-point decline from last week's crop progress report. Just 8% is good or to excellent. At this point, many producers are trying to determine their next course of action. Is there any benefit to harvest for grain or should they just cut it for silage? National reporter Tyne Morgan has been looking into this angle of the story. Tyne. Thanks, Clinton. Driving through Indiana isn't a pretty picture, and most farmers say they're keeping their eyes on the road and not even glancing over to look at any fields. By the height of the corn crop, you'd assume it's early June. But with many acres already turning brown from too little water, it looks like it should be August. As the crop continues to rapidly deteriorate, many farmers are turning to livestock as a possible source to consume what little is left. 2012 is one for the record books, and when looking at crop insurance, it's not a record that will leave many farmers bragging. We believe uh, it's going to lead to record number of claims. I think in this north central, northeastern part of Indiana it has been significantly impacted by the drought in the heat conditions we've had recently. Uh, I think 90, 95 percent of our growers will have claims going into the fall this season, so it'll be a record number on that end. We get corn that's uh, that's really under stress like this, and uh, you know it's really it's really done. For us this year, mature-wise, uh, it's not going to make any grain. With over a third of the nation's corn crop rain-deprived and in poor to very poor condition, farmers are looking for other options for their devastating crop. We're ready to, probably within a couple of weeks, ready to, to uh, um, cut the uh, cut the plant off and make actually make silage out of it. Klopfenstein's story is similar to many other Indiana farmers. Nearly 40 percent of the state is under severe or extreme drought. That's taking its toll on the state's crops and leaving many farmers in the same boat. This year we've had more interesting guys uh, wanting to destroy fields or tear them up or disc them or mow them or chop them. The corn that won't be making much grain will go into silage. We'll be chopping that probably here within the next month. Corn cut for silage may contain high nitrate levels and plants that are severely stunted and didn't form an ear, like in Klopfenstein. Klopfenstein's field, it could contain the highest levels of nitrates. Harvesting or grazing only the upper two-thirds of the plant will greatly reduce the risk of potential nitrate toxicity. The extension also suggests any damaged corn that's planned to be green chopped and fed to cattle should be tested before cut. This is forcing farmers like Don Shoemaker to not get too anxious and wait to harvest the crop for silage. In our situation, we don't green chop very often, uh, especially this year, we'll be ensiling that. That'll take down those nitrate levels and, and the others will be going towards grain. Clinton farmers in portions of northern Indiana did receive two or more inches of rain this past weekend. While it may help some of the corn for a large portion of the crop, it's too little too late. Thank you, Tyne. For producers who rely on grazing for their herds, the news isn't any better. The Crop Progress Report shows 18% of the nation's pasture and rangeland in good to excellent shape. That's down three points from last week. With a lack of forage, some livestock producers are shrinking their herds and sending their cows to slaughter. We saw a lot of that last year in Texas and Oklahoma. Producers were shipping their herds to locations outside the southern plains where grazing was available. But this year, it's different. There's a much bigger percentage of the country that's in some form of drought conditions. Forage production is down over a wider area. Hay production is down over a wider area. And so we will see, uh, you know, we're see what we're seeing is that when animals are forced to move, and, and we are certainly seeing that in some regions, that there's really no place for them to go uh, compared to last year. And so we're seeing a much stronger and much quicker market reaction uh, that is pulling these cattle down this summer. In other news, many livestock groups are encouraged that the Environmental Protection Agency has decided to withdraw its proposed livestock reporting rule. The rule was geared towards concentrated animal feeding operations, or CAFOs. The proposed rule would have required large feedlots to report a long list of information about their operations to the EPA. Some of those specifications included the type and number of animals confined, as well as latitude and longitude of the production area. The National Cattlemen's Beef Association thought this was serious overreach by EPA. NCBA credited EPA for listening to cattlemen's concerns. The BSE scare, commonly referred to as mad cow disease from earlier this spring, has not had a lingering impact on beef exports. No. You'll remember back in late April, USDA announced the fourth case of BSE in the United States. It came from a dairy cow in California. 
Fortunately for the industry, the news did not panic consumers. The month of May was the first month in which any BSE-related decline could be detected in export statistics. U.S. Meat Export Federation says May beef exports did not reveal a major impact, although global totals were likely affected to some degree by the market closure in Saudi Arabia and negative media coverage in some Asian markets.